Hello, welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akashrafi. Today, we're discussing the exploration of Africa, the history of anthropology and race, and a curious late 19th century and early 20th century trend in misattributing sophisticated work by ancient and modern peoples to lost white tribes. We're talking with Michael Robinson. Michael is a professor of history at the University of Hartford and author of The Lost White Tribe, Explorers, Scientists, and the Theory That Changed the Continent. He runs his own podcast, Time to Eat the Dogs, which you can find at timetoeatthedogs.com. The Lost White Tribe traces the emergence and evolution of the Hamitic hypothesis, an anthropological concept that posited that the children of the biblical figure Noah were responsible for the population of the earth. Of particular interest is Michael's work tracing how various cultural and scientific factors converged to reimagine Ham, one of Noah's sons, as the progenitor of lost white tribes in Africa. Although this was a global phenomenon, much of the book is told through the story of Henry Morton Stanley as he explored Africa in the late 19th century. Joining Michael to discuss his book are Mathilde Leduc Grimaldi, who's a museum curator at the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Belgium. Tyler Putman, the gallery interpretation manager at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, and Nicholas Barron, an adjunct assistant professor of anthropology at the University of New Mexico. Michael, thank you for joining us from Tasmania today. Oh, thank you. We both very much enjoyed reading your book, The Lost White Tribe, and you start by looking at the culture of exploration in the 1870s with Henry Morton Stanley's trek across Africa. That's right. The book, The Lost White Tribe, starts with Stanley's story. And there's many stories in the book about explorers going to various places and seeing things that they don't expect to see particularly the way that they are looking at various indigenous peoples. But I thought that in the writing of the book that Stanley's story was the most compelling. I should back up and say Henry Morton Stanley in the 1860s is tasked with going to Africa to try to find the missing British missionary and explorer David Livingston. Stanley at this point is a correspondent for the New York Herald, and with the approval of James Gordon Bennett, the head of the newspaper, he goes to Africa and finds Stanley and reports about it on his way and really becomes this kind of spectacularly celebrated figure in the middle decades of the 19th century. It probably becomes the world's most famous explorer, really, at that time. And in an attempt to capitalize on that expedition and the amount of fame and glory that came from it, Stanley goes back to Africa in the 1870s. There had been a debate at the time about the actual source of the Nile. And so There had been a number of disagreements, particularly among British geographers and British explorers, as to which lake was the origin of the Nile. And so Stanley goes to East Africa to repeat what he did so successfully in the decade before finding Livingston, but in this case trying to find the source of the Nile. And it was on this expedition in 1874, while he's trekking through East Africa, and he has a huge cadre of men that were essentially loaned to him by a local king, King Mutesa of Lake Victoria, that he notices that some of the men look quite different in physical appearance. They have very light skin. And so he writes about what he calls this white race of Africa, And it becomes a big story back home in the dispatches. And then he writes more about it in the narrative of his expedition when he comes back to the United States. I start with that story because it really catalyzes a lot of interest in so-called white tribes in various places of the world. And the story of Africa itself is a region in which these stories end up taking on a lot of meaning, not just among African peoples themselves, but among of the scientific community of Europe and the United States. When people try to explain the existence of white tribes in Africa, they return to some biblical interpretations. How do they do that? So one of the really interesting things for me about this project is the book unfolds really over a kind of 2,000-year arc. Most of it unfolds in the 1800s and 1900s. 
But there are really powerful links that go back to Judeo-Christian history. And the easiest way to explain this is to say that really prior to the 1700s, or even really the 1800s, people were using biblical stories of migration to explain why people look the way they do. And in particular, in the Judeo-Christian and Muslim contexts in the Middle Ages and even during the Renaissance, people would look to the story of Genesis, but not the story of Adam and Eve, which was essentially the original populating of the earth. They would look later to the story of Noah, because in Genesis 9, after God essentially realizes that the earth is corrupt and human beings are corrupt, decides he wants a do-over and essentially annihilates the earth with the exception of Noah and his family, which in the Bible is described as Noah's three sons and their families. And so it's very easy to go to med medieval sources and see map representations of the three known continents of the world, each of which has one of Noah's sons on it. And in the minds of many people, it was the repopulating of the world by Noah's sons that accounts for the ethnic and racial differences that you see. I guess I was expecting that this story would all be about the race science material that we know so well from the late 19th century and early 20th century about people measuring heads and looking at skin color and eye color and things like that. And in fact, there are a lot of very late references to these early stories of migrations that happened in Central Asia and the people that migrated out from those regions and became racially distinct. So yeah, so that was a surprising aspect of the story. Your story also goes beyond exploration and biblical interpretation to some of the sciences in the late 19th century, including archaeology, for example, and discovery of Greater Zimbabwe. Yes. So one of the things that was also really interesting for me, and a bit of a challenge because I'm not really a historian of archaeology and certainly not a historian of linguistics, but there were a number of different fields in which these stories of ancient migration start to play a role. Certainly in the role of linguistics, you have William Jones, who becomes a linguist, uh, a philologist, as they would have called it, in the late 1700s. He's a British scholar. He moves to India to become a barrister, and in the process of that, becomes fascinated with ancient languages, including Sanskrit. And through that process, realizes that there are these structural links between ancient languages that are quite geographically distinct. So, for example, links between Sanskrit and the structure of Latin and the structure of ancient Greek. And so it's only one more step for Jones to start then thinking about, well, why are these languages linked? There must have been a primordial people that spoke some common languages out of which these grew. And so what we would call this idea of Indo-European languages emanates from that source. And then in archaeology, you also have similarly archaeologists looking at various sites. In Great Zimbabwe, for example, for listeners who haven't seen Great Zimbabwe, it's this fantastic structure. It's really a city that exists in Zimbabwe and that is built out of this incredibly meticulous use of stonework to build these large oval enclosures, uh, as well as buildings that really populate this valley in Zimbabwe. And it had been rumored to exist from the time of the Portuguese. So there were Swahili traders who would come out of the interior of Africa and tell Portuguese traders about this fantastic city. So there are actually reports about it that go back quite far, but it really wasn't discovered, so to speak, I'm putting quotations around that, by Europeans until the mid-decades of the 19th century, when looking at how fantastically meticulous and beautiful these were, they started almost immediately looking for sources other than uh, indigenous African peoples as the creators of them. This happened as well with the pyramids in Egypt, where people are looking for some kind of foreign source. These are clearly too sophisticated for the people who live in this region. There must have been some kind of prior invasion of a more advanced civilized race to do this. And so archaeology, specifically in Africa, but in other places too, like North America, gets harnessed to this idea of ancient migrations of people from other areas that are more civilized and sophisticated. 
And then in your book, you go on to look at the broader residences beyond academia of ideas about the lost white tribes in the realms of fiction, for example. So, yeah, in the late 1800s, Stanley is coming back and reporting about, let's say, a lost race in the interior of Africa. And there are other reports from other areas of the world. For example, the people who go to Japan, particularly missionaries, talk about the complexion of the Ainu people on the North Island of Hokkaido and how they look Caucasian. And there are a number of reports like this from different regions of the world. And so adventure writers start to write about this. People who are writing what today we might call young adult fiction or juvenile fiction or something we might call science fiction or speculative fiction, they were calling scientific romances. But this genre of literature really starts to catch fire in the late 19th century with the publication of books like Treasure Island and Jacqueline Hyde. And probably the most famous book of this genre was King Solomon's Mines written by H. Ryder Haggard. Haggard had spent some time on the British colony in South Africa in the Transvaal and had heard some of these stories and used them as an inspiration for his own story, kind of an adventure story in which British explorers go into the interior and find this hidden race of people who have links to the world outside of Africa. And that becomes a huge blockbuster and generates more stories on a similar theme. So you could say that by the turn of the 20th century, a large percentage of the stories of what we would call adventure fiction were actually tied up with this idea of finding lost worlds and lost races, many of which were Caucasian. Are there more contemporary resonances of the ideas of white invasion or interpretations of racial or ethnic hierarchies in Africa, for example? Yes, there's some important ones. This idea that there were ancient proto-white or Caucasian invasions of various parts of the world was actually taken very seriously by ethnographers, anthropologists, linguists, really up through the 20th century. And it started to die out in the 1920s and 1930s, particularly with uh, the anthropological community, but actually these ideas lingered on after World War II and became especially important for certain political organizations. For example, the white apartheid government of Rhodesia really capitalized on the idea that Great Zimbabwe was developed not by indigenous African populations, but by some ancient white migration to the point where they were actually forbidding scholarship on theories that said otherwise. And in addition to that, that people who live in the areas themselves began to adopt some of these structures. So the fancy name for this in the book is the Hamitic hypothesis, the idea that one of the sons of Noah, Ham, had become the inspiration for this ancient migration of a civilized people into Africa. But in any event, that the Hamitic hypothesis and its variants became adopted and adapted by various groups of people. So for example, in Rwanda, uh, under the colonial control of the Belgians in the early 20th century, they started to racially type various groups. So the Bahutu became seen as indigenous Africans, whereas the Batutsi became known as potentially a proto-white or non-African group that had come from somewhere else. And even after the Belgians leave and decolonization occurs and their independence movements, there are many groups of Africans to this day who see themselves as having a origin story outside of Africa, and to, to sometimes to very you know terrible effects, as we see in Rwanda. Now, you went on an expedition of your own while you were working on this book. Can you tell us about that, why you did it, and how it turned out, and what you learned? Sure. So most of this book, I should say, is it's really an archival book. I spent a lot of time in archives and museums and libraries, pulling together sources from explorer reports and scientific journals and correspondence and that sort of thing. But I really felt that I wanted to go to some of the sites in which these events happened. And probably the most important was actually Stanley's expedition itself. There's a mountain 
in the west of Lake Victoria, a snow-capped mountain where these people, these this white race lives. And for a variety of reasons, Stanley can't get there himself. He sees the mountain from a distance, but actually has to turn because of some hostile groups in the area. And so I wanted to go to see what it was like. I also wanted to do some archival research in Kampala as well and talk to some scholars there who study these ideas of ethnic invasions from an African perspective. So I went with that motive as well, but I really did want to see the place. And I ended up hiking up Mount Stanley with a guide, a Ugandan guide and a porter in early uh, 2013. It, it was a long hike. It's a 17,000 foot mountain. It's actually the highest. It's now today called Mount Stanley. It's on the border of Congo and Uganda. And it's a six day climb. And you really are starting on the equator and moving up through various ecological zones to the summit. And at the summit, there's actually a glacier. It's one of the last remaining glaciers in Africa. So it's a very intense change. It's extremely remote. And I'm in pretty good shape, but I'm certainly not a, a technical or a high mountain climber. So it was quite a, an emotional experience for me. And of course, it wasn't that I was expecting to find anything up there, but I, I think I wanted to feel a little bit of what the isolation was like for Stanley and also to talk to local peoples about their experience of the mountain and their awareness of this history as well. But I think what I found on the mountain was not what I was expecting. I think it was so remote that I felt keenly my isolation from the rest of the world. My children were young. I have three children. My children were young at that point, and they had a variety of events going on. And I was, I was just so aware of these moments that I was out in the wilderness, completely cut off, that there were these things about their lives that I was missing. And after I summited, which is a very difficult summit, I experienced some altitude sickness and I couldn't really eat for the last two or three days of hike. It was very exhausting in terms of lack of oxygen, that sort of thing. On actually the, the return from the summit that night, I ended up having a kidney stone attack at 14,000 feet. And I knew what it was because I'd had one before. It was quite excruciating. And I really thought, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get down off this mountain. So I, I went up to the tent uh, of my guide, William Kavuna. And I said, I, I don't know how I'm going to get down. I think I'm having a kidney stone attack and I'm in a lot of pain. And he had a satellite radio. He called down to the base, which was like six days away. And they, and they said, well, we could send people up for him, but it's, it's going to be another week. You know, so your best chance, if possible, is to get yourself down off the mountain on your own legs if you can. And that's basically what I had to do is find a way to, to get down the mountain. I think the reason why it was important for the writing of this book is because it made me realize in that time of what intense vulnerability I was feeling. I'd only been hiking for a week, and I knew that I wasn't going to die on that mountain. I was in pain, but I wasn't going to die. And I thought Stanley was traversing Africa. He had none of these guarantees. He was in the field for three years. All of his European companions and assistants died of disease on the way. And so he was left essentially crossing Africa with Africans, many of whom he became very attached to. Stanley's an extremely controversial figure, and he was extremely brutal and barbaric in his treatment of some African groups. But it is also true that he became extremely attached emotionally to some of his African companions. And it made me realize in that moment how desperate we are in those moments to find the familiar, to find something we can associate ourselves to that feels comforting. And Stanley himself would often in his journals describe Africans as looking so much like Europeans that he knew back home. He said, if they weren't African, I would have thought they were. And then he would go off on a list of names of people he knew. Anyway, and this is a long story, but I think in the end, it gave me a way of trying to understand this question like, well, what actually was Stanley looking at when he was looking at people and saying he thought they were white? And what were these other explorers doing? Because we know now that they weren't, certainly not in any racial sense that they had intended. So if they weren't actually white in that sense, then who were they and why were they seeing it that way? And so in my own speculative way, that experience gave me a kind of provisional answer to that question. 
we sent your book to some other readers from different kinds of backgrounds and perspectives who have recorded some questions for you. Yeah, let me just queue up the first question for you. Greetings from Belgium. This is Matilda Leduc Grimaldi, your friendly archivist and specialist of Henry Morgan Stanley. My first question for you, Michael, would be this one. What specificities do the Stanley Archive, a set of private, non-official, non-institutional paper, bring to your topic compared to other non-published material from, say, ethnographical or anthropological societies in the US or Europe? And this is her follow-up question. Next question for Michael. If you had had more time, which other archives, especially from African archival centers, like in Zanzibar or Oma maybe, would have offered a focus of the Swahili side of the question at play in your book? I think I'll let, try to answer that second question first and then go back to the other one. So the Swahili side of the story is really important because as much as the story of the lost white tribe really tells the story of an interaction between European and North American intellectual communities and their encounter with and experiences with Africans and Africans' interpretations of their own origin stories as well and how these two sets of ideas kind of mingle together. It is also true that Another major group, which is Swahili traders from the east coast of Africa, many of whom were involved in the slave trade in the 1800s, played a really important role both in transmitting ideas and receiving ideas from the African interior. A lot of these are difficult to get to because they were not transcribed in the same way. So it's hard to get a lot of these archival sources. And so what became important for my story, what I could actually get my hands on, was a lot of the Muslim commentaries, early Muslim commentaries, about the stories of Genesis, which talk about the migrations of the people around the world and tries to offer explanations for why people look so ethnographically different from one another. And so it was really these medieval sources that I was looking at more than 19th century sources. To the first question, which was, what was the importance of the Stanley Archive in Belgium and why was it important in a way that, let's say, just reading Stanley's published works was? And I would say, you know, the Stanley Archive is an amazing place insofar as it has all of Stanley's field notebooks, it has his personal journals, it also has drafts of his articles and his books. And for me, that was very important because his story of this so-called white race that existed in Africa, it evolves over time. And so by re being able to read the drafts of his journal articles, his correspondence, his book drafts, you really get the sense that he's editing this story as it goes forward and editing it in interesting ways. He actually talks very explicitly about finding a white race in one book, and then it's all scratched out and he leaves it out of a final draft. And so these kind of edits became very important to me as I tried to piece together his story. So our second question comes from Tyler Putman. Hi, Michael, this is Tyler Putman. I'm the gallery education manager at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. I wondered if in your research you encountered the story of the Norwegian adventurer Tor Heyerdahl and his voyage aboard the recreated Pacific raft that he called Kontiki in 1947. When I read Heyerdahl's book years ago, I found the parts of it that dealt with indigenous Pacific cultures in particular to be rather troubling. And thanks to your book, I was able to see the history behind Heyerdahl's belief that advanced races migrated long distances to establish superior civilizations. Am I correct in connecting Heyerdahl's ideas on the subject with those of the people you trace in the Lost White Tribe? Uh, to Tyler's question, absolutely, the story of Tor Heyerdahl and Kontiki are connected to the story that's told in Lost White Tribe. In fact, what Heyerdahl is interested in proving, or at least making a case of plausibility for, is a kind of variant of the Hamitic hypothesis. And so let me explain it uh, just a little bit, which is that after you have this, this group of archaeologists and linguists who are suggesting that there's a cradle of 
the human species in Asia, and that from this kind of origin point in Central Asia, that waves of ancient white civilized people migrated outward from that point. You have theories such as the Aryan invasion of India and the population of Europe by so-called Aryan peoples. And a variant of that is, of course, the invasion of Africa by a group of Hamitic people, a kind of proto-white people. But that theory ends up extending in the late 19th century by some theorists to include areas of the Pacific. So when people are looking, for example, at the Polynesian people of the Central Pacific, they begin seeing this as part of the advanced stages of this invasion of civilized peoples, right? Proto-white civilized peoples that would then explain why they're such amazing navigators. <laughs> and what Heyerdahl was doing was in a way a variant of this because he had read in some Peruvian writings from the Andes stories of a light-skinned emperor and this kind of highly advanced, powerful Incan king from an ancient period of time. And that one of the things that Contiki was trying to prove was that perhaps this ancient South American indigenous group of white people or white light-skinned people had colonized the Pacific from the other direction, that they had sailed west into the Pacific and that that explains why we see various Polynesian peoples that are connected not to the east, but are connected to the west. I think Tyler is right to see both the links to my story and also some of the racist underpinnings of it, yeah. And our third question comes from Nicholas Barron. I also have a question about the history of the Hamitic hypothesis beyond Africa. Importantly, you note that Africa is not the only place in the 19th century where the origins of the indigenous or colonized people were under scrutiny. And here I'm thinking of Thomas Jefferson and other founding figures in the United States who became transfixed by the origins of living Native Americans and their connection to the ancient societies that built, say, the burial mounds in Virginia. Do you see evidence of lost white tribe type theories gaining ground in other parts of the world under imperial, colonial, or maybe settler colonial rule during this same period? Yes. In fact, one of the difficult decisions I had to make in writing The Lost White Tribe is how to cull all of the stories of so-called discoveries of white peoples in areas where you wouldn't expect them call that to a manageable group to provide a story arc because there's so many of them and so many of them take place within a relatively narrow range of time from about the mid 1800s through the first three decades of the 20th century and just to give some examples there's the so-called discovery of blonde Eskimos by Vilmer Stephenson an anthropologist in 1912 in the Arctic archipelago above Canada. And there's the so-called discovery of white Indians in Panama by another explorer in the 1920s, Richard March. There's also books written about the Aryan Maori of New Zealand. One of the theories that came into kind of popularity was this idea that the Maori people were Aryan in background. There are stories that connect to the British search through the Himalayas and Tibet in the part of the what's called the Great Game in the 19th century. So these stories are actually popping up all over, and they are intimately connected to colonization and imperialism because in many cases it gave colonial officers a way of justifying their colonial rule. It was an origin story. It was to say, you see, we were actually here, here at the beginning as well. It gave a kind of provenance to their colonial control. So that was used quite effectively in Africa as well as North America. It's true that, for example, the mound builders of Central North America, these structures were too sophisticated to be done by Native Americans. They must have been done by some foreign group from the ancient past. So yeah, there are many, many stories. Michael, do you have any final thoughts or observations about your project that you'd like to share with us? I think the only thing I would say is one of the things I found interesting in the writing of this book was it started out just being a way of trying to connect the dots of all of these strange stories of white tribes 
And in the end, what it made me realize is that there are links to the stories that we tell in the history of science as a field, which are connected very much with, let's say, racial science in the late 19th century, the measurement of skulls and the profile of noses and and the way that these are, let's say, used to categorize and classify people. I think one of the things I found in the writing of this book was how much that story is a global story. It plays out on a global stage. It is happening all over the world. And it's not simply a matter of, let's say, Europeans imposing their ideas upon indigenous peoples. It's Europeans using their ideas of race science and these ideas commingling with many ideas that are uh, origin stories that are powerful in the places that they're exploring and interacting with local peoples. And out of it comes these strange hybrid ideas of origin. It's certainly one in which the power dynamics are asymmetric. Certainly Europeans and colonial powers have a lot more political power in most of these stories. But it is a story that involves other people, even as in the West, we kind of laugh at these things now. There are many parts of the world in which the resonance of these stories still continue. And so I think it is important when we talk about race science as something that's imposed, perhaps, on other peoples, to realize that there's a much bigger story there and a much more complicated story of how these ideas mingle together with those from other parts of the world. Thank you, Michael. It's a, it's a fascinating book and a very readable book. And thank you for taking the time to chat with us about it. Oh, very much my pleasure. Thank you for, thank you for interviewing me. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. And I'm Jessica Linker, a program coordinator at the Consortium. You can find other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect to our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trust, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.